everyone, and welcome to another edition of Sunshine Spotlight. My name is James Campion, and it's really great to see uh, and talk to a good friend of the podcast and uh, the festival and just a good friend, writer friend in general, Cameron McGill. Cameron, welcome to the show, man. Hi, everybody. Hi, James. How are you? I'm very well. You. We should. Yes, yeah, it's so good to see you. Um, we should mention not only singer songwriter, which we'll talk about today, because it's mostly a music sort of artist, uh, <clears throat> Sunshine Spotlight. But again, yeah. Cameron, poet, educator, uh, teaches at Washington State University, and also has a brand new book of poetry called In the Night Field. It came out this June, so we'll talk about that as well. But I have to ask you, I don't have to ask everybody this question. Yes. How was your quarantine, and what did you do? <clears throat> What did I do? <laughs> what did you do? Did you write? Did you, were you creative? Were you like stymied? Everybody has a different answer to this. Yeah. Well, like a lot of people, I, I lost a portion of, of my mind, which was like ho-cruxed, you know, across various parts of the States as I spent time in different places. Um, I, you know, yeah, I, I've been teaching online, you know, the last uh, almost three semesters. So I feel very grateful, first and foremost, that I was able to work. Um, so there's that. Uh, and yeah, I spent a lot of it in Chicago and some of it here in Idaho, which is where I am now. Um, yeah, a lot of poems, wrote, tried to write a lot. I mean, I had the, 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 first, the chat book and, the, and In the Night Field both kind of came out during the pandemic. That's right, That's right. yeah. So I feel... I had a lot of deadlines to keep me honest, as it were. Um, during the pandemic, gave me some things like I knew I had to do. I had to, had things I had to deliver, which helped, you know, keep me grounded on that side of things instead of just kind of spiral, spiraling um, <laughs> into despair, as it were. Um, so yeah, you know, that it's it's been a lot of work um, for the school. You know, it's been a lot of teaching work. I think teaching online for people who teach, like it's even more work than teaching in person, which doesn't seem possible, but it is. Um, so uh, yeah, I just, it, it went by in such a, it was either like the longest 15 months ever or the slowest, I, it's, or, or, or like the quickest, it, you know, kind of went by, but at the same time, it just seemed to last a long time. So I, I've been busy, I guess, you know? <laughs> I have a couple of questions that you brought up just by saying those two things. I, I do want to touch upon your teaching. Um, is it important, how important is it to be in the same room with people when you're teaching a creative writing, poetry, discussion, discuss, is it that imperative or is there also, uh, I don't know, an intimacy of being online? Like what is the biggest difference in teaching yeah. for you? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think uh, there are certain things that work better in person, you know, having uh, like a group dynamic, um, you know, getting the whole class to like laugh at something, kind of like having that conversation where you can feel that like actual, you know, kind of energy in the room. Um, and, and especially in a, in a smaller creative writing class where um, I, I tend to try to make my creative writing classes feel a bit like sitting around like the family dinner table, where it's like we have a lot of conversations and, you know, yeah, it's like, tough. Well, it is, but it's also the family din dinner table is also tough. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think, you know, the thing that is, has been great about moving a lot of things onto Zoom uh, and teaching online is that certainly there is a lot more accessibility, um, you know, to, to uh, for, for, for all different kinds of folks who, um, you know, we, there's things that you can record them, you can watch things later if students have to go, you know, so many of my students would work throughout COVID, you know, grocery stores, you know, like they can't make it to class, like I can record it, we can have like a full class and they can, they can watch it later. <clears throat> that, that kind of accessibility, I think, is huge. And I think we're going to see uh, um, educators continuing a lot of those, those types of pandemic related, you know, teaching practices because they provide so much accessibility. But I do miss being able to have that kind of like in-person rapport, as it were, with like reading people's work and, and then being able to, 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 to see my excitement. You know, some stuff just doesn't translate as well. Sure. You know, so if none of my things are funny today, it's really because of, of Zoom. Right. Um, <laughs> not because of my, you know, <clears throat> you know what I mean? Sure do. 
Like that, for example. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Zoom is a good uh, excuse for, uh, <laughs> you know, for anything that you might have. All right. So uh, getting on to, the, uh, to your work, uh, I found that when I was, and I've talked to other writers as well, the isolation of being forced to be home, mm -hmm. forced to not do the podcast with Adam, go to New York to cover shows, to go do social things on the weekends. Mm -hmm. I, I grabbed that. And I, and I used it and I never realized how much time I spend not on my craft. And I wrote a book in a year and I did it because I, I used to think, well, I'm in my thirties, my forties, now I'm in my fifties. I can't physically write six to 7,000 words a day. I can't do that kind of research. I can, I just didn't have the time. I don't know <laughs> if you found that to be the case. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I ever write 60,000, six, 7,000 words a day. Um, <laughs> I, I, did, I did draft a lot of poems. I mean, I've just been kind of, you know, even in the process of, of working with my editor, Kate Angus, uh, on editing in the night field and getting that ready with the, the publisher at, at Aubrey Books, Joe, Joe Pan and um, Brooklyn Arts Press, those working with them, like there was a lot of um, work on, on, the, on the book, on the manuscript, on, on getting things set up and the design stuff and all that. But, but uh, the time I took creatively was split into two things really um i've been working on a new album which i'm, I'm mixing right now we're about halfway through and that's been several years in the making um and and then i've been working on poems for for the next book um and so just been drafting a lot of poems continually trying to get them catch caught, caught up get myself caught up and actually get them typed up i i i, I always write by hand and pencil in a notebook at first and then i um, get to typing them up at some point when I feel less adverse to it. Um, so yeah, that, it, I think it was a combination of those things. I, I it was hard to, you know, I, I, I like working, I like doing creative work. You know what I mean? Like I, I feel like I've always been like a worker bee as it, as it were, but like, there's also just, you gotta take breaks. I mean, it's like, there's times where like your creative work can be like, you finish your day of, of work and then you want, you're excited to do this other work. But sometimes that's just not the case, right? It's, it's like, I get done with the day. I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not capable of doing anything else right now, except sitting in front of the TV and drinking some beer um, or listening to records, right? I mean- Turning your mind off, turning that- or off trying to, Right, yeah. So that, I mean, like, I think it was, a, it was a bit of like in the pandemic, allowing myself some space, you know, um, and then working, working when I, when I felt like I could. And a few of the, few of the months in pandemic, I did like a po poem a day thing. It's where you write you one know. poem every day for 30, 30 days. And it's great. And you, you know, you do two months and you've got 60, you know, shitty first drafts, but uh, you know, you also just like, oh man, like you finish your work day sometimes nine, nine thirty at night, depending on like nighttime events. And then you got to start that poem a day and you're like, I'm not ready. I'm not right. ready. Yeah. So, you know, you can make yourself hate, hate it if you want, but sure. Um, sure. yeah. So just trying to, you know, change it up enough to get through each day and feel like I got something left in the tank. Sure. Now, the one thing I love about Cameron is he always sends me his work and I got his, his chat book as he mentioned uh, the last one. And, um, <laughs> It's just great getting in the mail. I, I mean, I'm very inspired by the fact that, you know, you write in the prose. Uh, why write in the prose? You write in the, in the lyric and or the, um, the verse. Uh, and I want to give the, I know we usually do in music and I, and I know you're going to play an acoustic version of one of your new songs coming up in a minute, but I did want you to read a couple of things if you would, uh, you know, be so kind from the new book and, you know, to give people a flavor of what your work is like. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, this is the book, it's called In the Night Field. Uh, came out um, on June 1st from Augury Books, um, which is an independent press. Um, it's an imprint of Brooklyn Arts Press. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll start with the, the first poem <clears throat> uh, in section two. This, this poem takes its title from a Van Morrison song, um, uh, you, don't pull no you, don't push, you Don't Pull No Punches, But You Don't Push the River from Veed and Fleece. Uh, and um, this is one of my favorite albums of his. And so um, this, this is a poem called William Blake and the Eternals. William Blake and the Eternals after Van. I was a late arrival here. Years spent pulling my voice apart like a wishbone for song. I started a band to meet girls 
and metaphysicians. We called ourselves William Blake and the Eternals. Something was missing. I sang goals. It sounded like girls in an English accent. I sang what is emptiness to what is no longer empty. We had no hits, obviously. <laughs> they dropped us in late spring with the noise of a coffee mate clicking. They'd done the numbers and no. It took a sleepless year in a stranger's basement on Monticello not to kill myself. I sang, I've done the numbers and no. Our only song had been a poem about a man holding a lantern at the end of a long hallway, lined with books and firewood. He haunted me, as did his horse, which all night would shift its legs, stamping gently the floorboards. The song was called Farriers. I sang it only once in Montana in late August 89, as my father and I stood in a field at dusk and with the fog holding everything, a yoke of starlight lifted from him, weightless and lifetimes ago. <clears throat> Damn. That's good, man. Oh, thanks. That was good. You know what that reminded me of? It reminded me of, you know, when I was in band, so I was a kid, <laughs> that, that feeling of um, not having a foundation. You're just kind of flying into different things, and you're hoping that you get there. I love the uh i don't know I, there's a trepidation about that poem that hits me in that sense where there's a great feeling when you're young that it's all there for you but there's also this fear that what the hell am i doing yeah. with my life where is the where is it coming from where is the strength coming from it makes me keep going and i i love you know i also love the fact that william blake continues to speak to generations of <laughs> musicians and poets especially musicians it's what is it about blake that yeah. that what does that mean to you when you use him in that way to name a band after him? What, why, why Blake? I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this of course started with, with the Van Morrison song and lyric, you know, more than it did, uh, you know, songs of innocence necessarily, but like, sure. uh, you know, Blake, Blake seemed to be such an interesting character, wrote, wrote his own books, published and did his own drawings, like was, was kind of like putting together multimedia, as it were, like approaches to poetry and art. Yeah, it was really interesting to me, you know, um, to think of someone like that at, at his time, um, kind of embarking on those kinds of things and kind of just like, well, I'm going to go into the territory, the unexplored territory here of um you know, how I want my art to be presented. And if that means I got to put together the book and I've got to do the art, well, I'm going to do all these things to get it to that place where I think that it's going to be received closest, most closely in the way that I want it to be presented, you know? Right. So I think, I think that's interesting. I mean, I, you know, also it's just a great band name, William Blake and the Eternal. Um, it really is. I mean, I love it just yeah. sounded, you know, I mean, there's a million band names, blah, 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 and, you know, Karen McGill and what army? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, there's how many, um, and so uh, yeah, part of it was just kind of that idea of, you know, uh, with a wink, start, starting a band, you know, with serious intentions, right? you know, like we often do, but also with, you know, I'm, I'm here to meet girls and metaphysicians as well. Right. So exactly. it's like, yeah, okay. Right. I don't know. You know, it just seemed like a place that could, could, could it kind of encompass all those things. And yeah. yeah. Well, don't give away the secret of why any of us get into anything, right? I don't have any answers. Please, anyway. So you got another one for us before we play your song and we'll talk about the music on the other side. Uh, one more, please. Uh, did, did any of the work, was any of the work inspired by the isolation we all went through or some of the things that you might've been thinking about or did you get out of your headspace to write the the, the poems. Yeah, I mean, so many, of, uh, a lot of these poems would, would have, you know, even started in 2017, 2018. Um, it's, things have been revised, you know, a lot, uh, a lot of the poems from Meridians, the chapbook, um, yeah. found their way into here as well. And so there's been several different iter iterations of the poems. Um, and, um, you know, there were several later editions to the book. The one I just read is one of them, um, kind of from the pandemic time. But um, 2020, you know, in the front part of 2020 is probably, you know, to mid 2020 is when, when I kind of added any last things to the manuscript, you know. So um, 
some, but not as much. A lot of this was, you know, the book was sent out to Augury in December or January, January of 19, maybe, or late no, December. I, listen, you know, so, you I know. Do. I the do. lag, people, you know the lag time. Right, people don't so, realize that. I, yeah. I, my deadline for my current book was April and I have, I'm not even copy edit yet. The book's coming out in March, 2022. It's usually about 10 months to 12 months for a book to come out for right, me. Right, right, yeah, right. Yes, I mean, we, this, I think the manuscript got picked up in March of 20, 2020, and then it came out in June of 21. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, most of the poems like had been written, but some, some certainly there was more editing and a few that were added from after the pandemic started, but right. um, it's a- All right, well, read any one you would like, any one you think uh, yeah. one more. Yeah, this is yeah. great. Thank you very much for doing this. Of course. So um, a lot of the poems in the book uh, have latitude and longitude coordinates um, for right. title. And this one is, um, uh, is one for a specific place in Chicago. And it's uh, 41.9740 degrees north, 87.6782 degrees west. I'm less the buildings I used to live in and more the strangers passing in their, in their windows the woman dancing with her baby, holding him high, a man carrying laundry to the bedroom with a beer. I return your shadow to where I found it in me, beside chimneys on Damon Avenue, in an alley piling breath into January. I live in too much silence. There needs to be someone in the car, the room, the bed. The world in its heartbreak of mastery wants me undone to come here knowing nothing should want to speak except the wind and frost on the grass in shadows of trees on Winnemac. This all starts to sound the same. The city, the block, my assurances, the deficits they make of memory. <laughs> Yesterday, I met the woman I lived with for years. My remembering a bath, her knees, islands in the cooling water. I'm afraid describing things ruins them. That's not true. It was me who asked what the body wanted and didn't listen for the answer. Hmm. Nice. The deficits of memory, man. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You always think of that. that you know, my wife always makes a joke that I, when I tell stories, I use poetic license, even though I'm not a poet. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, your memories, you, are. Are some, you have to make them drum. I mean, Adam and I talk about this all the time. You're not writing a diary. You're writing an experience to get the person to feel that experience. That's an experience poem to me. You went through something there and by utilizing a geography and weather and the, the bath is there's a memory. I love the deficits of memory because we do have this idea that we don't remember exactly the way it is, but the way we remember it, it's the important thing. Yeah, that's really well said. I mean, I, so much of this book is about, is about memory. And I think the, co you know, the coordinates, the latitude longitude coordinates, you know, certainly are trying to ground these poems in particular places. And there's a handful, you know, mostly four or five places um, where I've lived for a length of time. But I think since a lot of the poems have the same title, those same locations, it's multiple attempts uh, at those places to get at memories of those places really, I guess in some ways to try to get at the emotional coordinates of those places. Right. You know, right. Just the physical latitude, longitude. Yeah. Sure. And it puts you in that place. Well done. Well done. Thank you so much, man. Great work. Oh, Can't thanks. wait to get the copy myself. All right. Yeah. You got a new record coming out uh, and uh, you're working on it now. It's going to be a little while, but we talked <laughs> about, we talked about this yesterday. We did a little pre chat and uh, I think I'm going to get you to play an acoustic version. Now I have not seen this, and because um, when we're taping this, you have this is the cool part. You haven't even done it yet. So Bob, I want you to tell me what song it is and yeah. then we'll we'll preview it for everybody and then uh, we'll play it and then we'll come back and talk about the new music. Am I doing one song or two? I can't Dude, remember. One is fine. One is fine. Yeah. OK. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm going to uh, the song is called uh, I'm going to blow up and it's going to be on the new album, which is is going to be called The Widow Cameron. Oh, cool. Cool. Why the widow Cameron? Yeah, why not? Um, why not? 
good yeah no no i mean um yeah i mean i i it, it came about the writing of these songs in some ways is a real companion to to this but um it didn't necessarily want to you know name the album the same as the book and um but i think people will see some conversations between the songs and and some of the poems certainly and um yeah i think it was at, at a time where i had removed removed myself from a lot of things uh, leaving chicago leaving a relationship um to go back to school and um yeah i think you know uh, in some ways, I felt gone um, and left. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So the widow Cameron just seemed to kind of, and you know, the widow or Cameron just didn't sound right to me. Right. Yeah. No. It's that's why I asked. You know, it's it's uh, it's interesting because it speaks a lot about what we were talking about before: geography and memories. When mm -hmm. each part of life goes by, it's like mini deaths, mini mornings. I, I don't mm -hmm. mean to be too, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. maudlin about this but like when my daughter grows up she's not the same human being it's a different human being now at 13 mm -hmm. and my little girl at seven or eight yeah and, yeah. and it, she's oh, gone yeah. she's gone so mm -hmm. it's like she becomes somebody else and that's great too and I love watching her grow but there is a morning for that other time and that's true of mm -hmm. friendships relationships and then as far as I lost my dad in 2019 and when mm -hmm. you mentioned your father in 89 and that previous poem you know, anytime that always gets to me because, you know, you, you try to have the, you have those snapshots. You try to remember when before they're gone. So I, I totally get that idea of the widow, Cameron. Absolutely. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm just, you know, I don't probably fully understand it, but that's what keeps it exciting to me, I guess. <laughs> All right. So the name of the song is? I'm going to blow up. All right. This is Cameron McGill. Bye. 
on fireflies, fireflies long. I'm feeding on a firefly, fireflies long. Feeding on a firefly, fireflies long. I'm feeding on a firefly, fireflies long. That is Cameron McGill from an upcoming record called Widow Cameron, and that's I'm Gonna Blow Up. Thank you so much for doing that, man. Uh, really appreciate it. And reading the poems. One last thing before we get to the music about the poetry. Yeah. You said you were going to talk about this, maybe off the show, but I just wanted to get a little... You're doing an audiobook of these poems. Now, yeah. I think poetry is great when it's read in the voice of the poet. When I, I love <laughs> live poetry readings, I really. I, and, and that's the best way, I think, to read poetry. That's why people read this, the sonnets of Shakespeare aloud or anything like that. How was that experience doing that? Because it was weird for me. I, I got my first audio book from, from my Kiss book, comment, like, yeah. I think last year. And just hearing another voice reading it was very weird. But how has it been for you? Uh, it? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So like thinking about like reading it, um, versus having someone else read it it must i mean like that must be really interesting yeah so i i i um yeah i read it my, myself um it just because it, it seems like the thing you know for the poetry book and like just sure. you know with and with folks who maybe have followed along with me releasing records you know for the last 15 years or whatever so i kind of wanted this in some ways to be like another document another record um but of, of the poems of, of of reading the book and so um yeah, I mean, it was. I did two days in the studio with um, my good friend and, and, and bandmate uh, Rodrigo Palma, uh, who uh, engineered um, and um, graciously and kindly sat with me for for two days as I read through the entire book multiple times, and um, <clears throat> you know, uh, kind of gave me some feedback on things that I, I couldn't that he couldn't hear or like you know in terms of my pacing and so it was really great to have someone who's like really in tune with those things um to kind of um keep me on track but uh it was an interesting thing i mean i've never i've never i've never done that that before obviously um you know it's the first full length book and and certainly and first audio but you've book. read the poetry al aloud before so yeah yeah i mean i love the reader and the breaks and the drama you know video. yeah i mean it changes a little bit of course but yes yes i mean i've always enjoyed doing poetry readings it's been quite some time since i have of course but um um, unless it's been on Zoom, but I, even that I enjoy, I enjoy reading them. Um, and I think there is, you know, there's something about sitting with the book in, at your own speed and reading it, right. you know, um, and then there's something about hearing it that brings out, you know, different things, whether it be the intonation of the way certain things are said or the, right. it's like music. the cadence. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't know that there's a lot of poetry books out there that are audio books. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anyone will, will want to buy it, but um, I figured it'd be a fun thing for me to do for people who are following along, you know. And what's that coming out? That's a great question. Um, again, uh, um, my guess is, you know, late this year at the earliest, probably early next year. Okay. Very yeah, good. we'll see. So yeah. Right. Well, congratulations on all of that. Well, thanks. Um, yeah. So we just geeked out on writing, and I apologize for anyone who didn't who was looking forward to the musical discussion of this show because we're like twenty minutes in and we haven't said. All right, so let's get to the music, which I love, and that's how I was introduced to you through the podcast and, and interviewing you and seeing you play at the at the festival. Um, these songs, where did they come from? How did you put them together? And just your thoughts on the new music? Oh yeah, so 
That, that's a um, great question, like just so, so much. So a lot of it started um, as I was preparing to leave Chicago in 2015. Um, wow. I had left, I had, um, well, we released, the last record I put out was 2013, uh, Gallows Etiquette. And- um, Oh, that long ago, huh? Okay. Yeah, that came out in 2013, late 2013. And um, <clears throat> I had a lot of demos that I had been writing, you know, you know, during the making of Gallows Etiquette that weren't on that record, you know, of course, that were gonna be considered for the next. And, and um, we, I think before I left, like we made a real concerted effort to Charlie, Coltac, who, who plays drums, a dear friend of mine as well, Rodrigo Palma and myself went into the practice studio in Chicago and recorded, you know, maybe 45 demos before I left for grad school. Cause I knew once I started school, well, I'd probably forget half of them right. and I wasn't going to have time um, or as much time uh, to, to, to devote to, you know, um, demoing things out. And, and I was, sure. you know, so and, and I'm glad I did, you know, because like I would have forgotten a lot of them. And so we, we, we were able to get a document of those songs. Um, so we, we went through and uh, from that group, you know, uh, along with maybe a couple later editions and, and, and narrowed it down to 12 songs. Um, and so we started recording um, the album um we did the tracking in, in four days in um, August, no, July of 2019. Because we were all in Chicago, we were able to get everybody together in the room. You know, all the, both those guys have kids, uh, you know, and so we were, we were, we had like a, a spreadsheet of like, okay, so we can have, we have Rodrigo from two to three o'clock. We have Charlie from two to four. And then after dinner, they can come back and then bedtime, they can come back. So like, I mean, they had young kids. So we were just trying to find a few hours. So we, we did those songs. Um, and then, um, you know, COVID, all the things. Um, I ended up doing the vocals uh, exactly one year later, same studio. So uh, August of 2020, I sang the vocals. Um, and now we are uh, mixing it. It's, it's been being produced by a, a gentleman named Daniel Johnson from Detroit. And um, it's being mixed right now. We're about halfway through. So, you know, it's been, it's been a long process, but the amount of like the actual time with us in the room together, it was very short. <laughs> the process itself has been very long. So that's a strange kind of dichotomy there, but it's, it's, it's worked out really the only way it was going to work out with me in Idaho, Dan in Detroit, the other two guys in Chicago. It's, you know, and it's, it's fine. It'll come out when it's done. And uh, I'm very excited about it. I think it's, a, um, it's a very different record um, from anything I've put out before. Why it, quickly? Why is it different? Oh yeah. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, someone else is producing it. I always produce my own records. You know, okay. To, well, I mean, you know, part 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 because. Um, <laughs> nobody else wanted to produce them and I didn't know what I was doing but I had songs I wanted to record and I, there was bands and people who wanted to, to do that with me so we made records and so that was always kind of like a group kind of thing like the band would kind of put it together but like this was something where I was I had less of an, an idea of how the song would be arranged and the style in which it would be approached after writing it my only concern for this album was writing just the best songs I could write and you know I wanted Dan to, to produce this record. And I wanted him to, to bring his, his genius to the songs in terms of how we, we would go forward. And so we worked as a group of four and following Dan's lead in, in tracking the album. And then Dan did a bunch of like production af, you know, after we did our tracking. Um, and we kind of would go, I mean, we, we've done mostly all of the communication about the record on Slack because it's the only way we're able to like message each other and put, and so like we have the Slack channel for the album and it's just, you know, I, I, it's, Slack is, the, the rabbit hole is pretty deep. I'm, I'm lost. We've gotten, we, all of us have been lost in Slack uh, trying to find things, but it's, um, it was the one way we could communicate and share the files and like get our, our mix feedback and get it to the engineer. So, you know, it, it's work, but um, yeah. So I think that's the biggest thing. And then also just like the growth of the songs. 
and the growth of us playing together as a band. It's the same band that played on, uh, on Gallo's Etiquette. And um, we just have a certain rapport that I think has deepened over, over time in terms of our approach to the songs. And we're just trying to take more chances. And uh, those guys are always willing to, to follow me wherever it seems I might be um, going. And then I was able to follow them. And Dan's been, <laughs> Dan's been leading us uh, uh, through the forest, as it were. Well, thanks a lot for giving me so much time here. I know you've got a lot of stuff going on, so I wanted to give you the time to talk about it. Um, and by the way, nice Paul McCartney picture back there. I, I asked you right before we started taping, that's from the original 68 White Album, right? It is, yeah. My uncle gave me that album a long time ago, and I, I had the vinyl, but yeah, I, I lost Ringo behind the piano. I can't, <laughs> I can't get him. Sorry, Ringo. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, so, you know, he was there too. Yeah. But that's the only two I had left. Otherwise, the whole band would be there. But, yeah, it's um, weird because Ringo and, and Paul are the two ones that are still Yeah, it's very, very strange that that's how it worked, that over yeah. the years, yeah, I, I don't know. Well, maybe I never had all four, but that's, that's what I had when I moved here. Yeah, that is strange. Yeah, and also spending a year with Paul McCartney, I, you know, I see Paul McCartney there. It's, you know, I, just, I immediately direct towards it. But anyway... Thank you so much. Once again, let's, let's talk about Cameron's year because it's been a good one. Uh, and he's working on a brand new album, uh, mixing soon, and it will be out uh, in 2022, I assume? Yeah, I think in the, probably in the front part of 2022, yeah. Yeah, and that is Widow Cameron. And In the Night Field is available now anywhere you get your books, poetry or otherwise, right? Yeah, yeah you can get it from augurybooks.com. Um, and you can get it... Uh, from your local independent bookstore, they can order it. Um, you can get it from bookshop, bookshop.org. Really anywhere that sells books, you can get it, yeah. Yeah, please do, God, he, he's a wonderful poet and a great guy, as you could tell. Listen, man, it's been great seeing you. Thanks. I hope I, <laughs> oh, oh, thank you, man, I hope I see you soon and uh, appreciate you giving us a few minutes here, really. Best of luck for the rest of the record. I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, pleasure's mine, man, thanks so much. All right, take care. We'll okay. see you next time on Sunshine Spotlight. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.